Good afternoon. Um, the Bible speaks about the perseverance of the saints as the key characteristic of those who are living in the end time. And uh, it's good that you have persevered and that you, you, you came back. Um, before I start with my presentation, may I just um, say for those um, who are here that uh, there is a wonderful book on display there um, on the hot topic, another hot topic in the church on ordination of women. And um, if you're interested, you can, um, you can get copies here or you can, you can f um, buy them online. Uh, also, may I also say while I have the opportunity here that New World College is also organizing a Bible conference um, on Hear the Prophetic Voice, which will happen uh, on the Sabbath of 9th of March 2013 at New World College. And I believe Dr. Antich is one of the speakers there. So um, if you're interested on, <clears throat> um, to hear something on the topic of uh, the uh, prophetic voice, then New World College has something on offer on this. Getting under the skin of Ellen White on perfection, it's not easy. And um, there is much more in the title than what you, you think, actually, uh, there is. When do the saints receive the spotless garment of Christ's righteousness? What does this have to do with the double perspective of Scripture, of already and not yet? A lot. Ellen White's contribution to the subject of perfection has been a matter of a long and ongoing discussion, tension, and even misuse of her writings by various sites and groups. And it is because we Adventists are convinced that God indeed spoke through her, through her ministry, and inspired her writings, and therefore we passionately read them and involve them in our discussions. In this presentation, I would like to propose that in her writings, we do find the same double perspective on salvation and perfection, which also New Testament writers have concerning the same topic. These perspectives I'd like to demonstrate this afternoon will help us to make sense of her contribution on the matter of uh, biblical perfection. And if taken seriously, this double perspective, it could hopefully ease some of the tensions and misunderstandings we have had in this area up until today. What I intend to do in my presentation is first to look at the double perspective she has concerning perfection, the already perspective first, then the not yet perspective she has on perfection, and uh, then I'm going to um, uh, discuss some important passages um, um, that relate to this matter, more specific passages. So, first, perfection in the already of salvation in Ellen White's writings. There is no question that Ellen White believed in the possibility of character perfection for every Christian in this life. Not only she believed in that possibility, she also, with her prophetic authority and power, called Christians to achieve it. Here is a brief illustration of this, if you don't believe me. The Lord requires perfection from his redeemed family. He calls for perfection in character building. Now, um, if you email me, I can provide you the whole paper, uh, with the whole paper and with the footnotes and the sources for this. Furthermore, she said, perfection of character is attainable by everyone who strives for it. You want more? We can overcome, yes, fully, entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation, and sit down at last with him. I have a few more. We should cultivate every faculty to the highest degree of perfection. Moral perfection is required of all. 
Those who would be workers together with God must strive for perfection of every organ of the body and quality of the mind. Another one. It is the work of Satan who is constantly seeking to deceive the followers of Christ with his fatal sophistry that it is impossible for them to overcome. God will give faith and grace to overcome them in the context, meaning defects. Let me repeat what I said to you. There is no question that Ellen White has emphasized the present already aspect of perfection. She has called for it in very sharp and clear terms. It's difficult to explain away this, saying there is no call for Christian perfection. How now to confuse the situation a little bit more? She also indicates that perfection of character will not reach Christ's pattern. So people on both sides, those who want to overextend perfection to absolute meaning, and also those who want to minimize the call to perfection, they have something to chew on here. Here is her dynamic perspective. He is a perfect, a perfect and holy example, given for us to imitate. We cannot equal the pattern. But we shall not be approved of God if we do not copy it, and according to the ability which God has given, resemble it. Huh, that's interesting. We cannot perfectly reproduce the pattern. But we will be guilty if we don't try to resemble it. This statement is made in the context of rejecting selfishness, actually, and loving others, which could be an indication where she is going with, um, um, with the explanation and where we should go with the explanation. Uh, I'll explain it in a moment. But furthermore, um, on this matter. Christ is our pattern, the perfect and holy example that has been given to us to follow. We can never equal the pattern, but we may imitate and resemble it according to our ability. Here's a brief statement. This one is from Manuscript 24, if you want. No one is perfect but Jesus, she said. Simple statement. Furthermore, even the most perfect Christian may increase continually in the knowledge and love of God. So even those who are perfect, there is growth. And the last. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect. Yet of God's purpose for yet of God's purpose for us, God's telos for us, is fulfilled, there will be continual uh, advancement. So at every stage there is a possibility of perfection, but there is also growth. So what's going on here? How can we solve the discrepancy or the tension? Here, let me quote Dr. Herbert Douglas. Dr. Antich has mentioned him. Somebody who promotes the ideas of uh, um, um, Andreasen here. I think he has something helpful to say here. He, he said, he suggested that perfection in the biblical sense is simply Christ-likeness, combining a relationship with God such as Jesus had with the qualities of character that Jesus manifested. Perfect love, right, towards God. Um, he is, I think, on the right track when suggesting that the qualities of character of Jesus are the key to understanding the present, present uh, perfection. So, what is helpful is to realize what Ellen White means by character perfection. 
And um, what is the context of character building in her writing? What does she mean by character perfection? Commenting on the two gospel passages that I have mentioned in my morning's presentation, in my first presentation, uh, on Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, which are the only places where the word uh, teleos appears, perfect, in the gospels. On the first one, on Matthew 5, 48, this is what she has to say. Oh, sorry, I d this, is, this is not, not on Matthew 5, let me just back up a little bit. I don't have the quotation here, but it, it's a short sentence, basically. Uh, she basically, commenting on this passage, which contains the word perfect, she says, uh, as God is perfect in his sphere, so man may be perfect in his sphere. As God loves the whole world equally, so we can in our own sphere love as God loves the bad and, uh, and the good as well, uh, friends and enemies. So, um, the context is God love. As God is perfect, we can be as well. Commenting on the second passage, it becomes more interesting. Um, in Matthew 19, she becomes a little bit more specific of what Jesus is called to perfection to the rich young ruler meant. This is what she has to say. Christ read the ruler's heart. Only one thing he lacked, but that was a vital principle. He needed the love of God in the soul. This lack, unless supplied, would prove fatal to him. His whole nature would become corrupted, that he might receive the love of God, his supreme love of self must be surrendered. Christ made the, on, uh, the only terms which could place the ruler where he would perfect a Christian character. Getting away with selfishness to love for God. It looks like that we might be on the right track if we consider the present character perfection in Ellen White to be rooted in heart transformation from loving self to loving God and others. Perfect character appears to involve perfect heart with supreme loyalty to God. Love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the, uh, the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. When self is merged in Christ, in Christ motive, love springs forth spontaneously. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. This is how she defines present perfection, present character perfection. The essence of righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right. Loyalty, undivided heart. Thus George Knight, who has, uh, I'll turn back up a little bit. Uh, George Knight, who has been all his life involved both practically and academically with perfection, concludes that love is the golden thread that runs across and through how the various spheres of divine and human perfection. It is the key that unlocks the mystery of what it means to be perfect like Christ in the now. See, just one comment here, a footnote. Uh, Ellen White's five-volume series on the drama of salvation begins with the sentence, God is love, and ends with God is love as well. This is a kind of big umbrella within which what we have and is happening is, you know, happening under this umbrella. So Ellen White indeed calls for present experience of perfection as character perfection. It is part of the already package of salvation, just like conversion, faith, experience of forgiveness, baptism, or sanctification. So is perfection which stems from heart and mind change leading to perfect loyalty to God, even perfection of leading lives in which we shall have no relish in sin because we love God but not the sin. Yet perfection, which is absolute in the sense of 
having the exact same character as Jesus, as she explains. That's not quite what we're going to reach here. That's not the work of present salvation. Similarly, while we may strive to lead sinless lives, we cannot claim sinlessness in the already of salvation, as I will show you soon. To become complete in Christ is God's work in the not yet of salvation, a work accomplished in what the prophets call that day, on that day, or day of the Lord. We now turn to explore this framework to complement Ellen White's understanding of perfection with a not yet perspective now. Okay, this is the right slide. When it comes to Ellen White's not yet future aspect of perfection, this can be seen in many places. Um, for example, she introduces the elements that belong to the not yet of salvation when she says, um, when the saints of God are glorified, that's the kind of language of uh, not yet, it will be safe to claim that we are saved and sinless. Then it is safe to say we are sinless. We cannot say, I am sinless, she says, till this vile body is changed and fashioned like unto his glorious body. Because sin is also in my body. When sin happened in Genesis 3, it was not just in the hearts and minds of people. It affected the whole creation physically as well. So this is just one of the examples that she thinks of perfection also in future terms. Notice that she introduces the experience of glorification, which is the classical code word for the not yet experience of God's people and for Bible writers. And it includes this not yet perspective, sinlessness, full salvation, full assurance. Now they can know they are saved and sinless. Similarly, we could go on and observe this theme from many other passages. But for the purpose of our discussion, I will turn my attention rather to the most systematic and comprehensive exposition on this matter, which could be found in her last book published, the last book she has written. The book is called Prophets and Kings. And I will look into chapter 47. This, apart from being one of the most systematic and comprehensive places, is also representative of her latest and most mature understanding on the subject of salvation and perfection. She worked on the book for several decades. The book was finally published in 1917, two years after her death. And it is because that in the uh, months leading up to her injury and death in, in 1915, she was finishing the book, but she couldn't finish uh, a few bits and pieces of two chapters um, in the book. And then because of the funeral and everything that took place, the book was published a little bit later, two years uh, after she died. But she worked on it for the last decades of her life. The chapter which we will consider now has to be read in conjunction with the key chapters of chapter 38 and 39 in a great controversy book. And I insist on that, that they have to be read together. They speak on the same matter, the same context, and when we take one outside of the other, we don't have the full picture. Uh, they complement each other, in other words. So uh, that's important to do. The chapter is called Joshua and the Angel, and it could be found from pages 582 to 592, so 11 pages. In the beginning of the chapter, she, and I'm going to dive into this now, and we'll run through this. Um, the steady advancement, um, she begins the chapter by saying something about the steady advancement of uh, the temple builders who returned from captivity they came back to Jerusalem and they wanted to build the city and the temple, especially the temple. And uh, their effort was frustrated by Satan's work. 
He didn't want the temple to be rebuilt and to be the center of the religion again. So this is the beginning of the chapter. And I'll jump to page 5A3, uh, where she begins to uh, go more uh, deeper uh, to the issues. And now this work, she says, and I think I should have slides, so let's see. Sorry, not yet. I will, I, I will come to the, some of these slides in, in a second. Yes, let me just say this. Uh, this is not, not on the screen, but let me just introduce the context very briefly. Um, and now that this work of restoration had begun, and a remnant of Israel had already returned to Judea, Satan was determined to frustrate the, uh, the carrying out of the divine purpose. And to this end, he was seeking to move up the heathen nations to destroy them utterly. But in this crisis, the Lord strengthened his people. And now comes what you will see on the screen and, and you can follow me. Through an impressive illustration of the work of Satan and the work of Christ, he showed God the power of the mediator to vanquish the accuser of his people. In the vision, the prophet beholds Joshua the high priest clothed with filthy garments, standing before the angel of the Lord and uh, entreating God's mercy in behalf of his afflicted people. As he pleads for the fulfillment of God's promises, Satan stands up boldly to resist him. He points to the transgressions of Israel as a reason why they should not be restored to the favor of God. He claims them as his prey and demands that they be given into his hands. The high priest cannot defend himself or his people from Satan's accusations. He does not claim that Israel is free from fault in filthy garments, symbolizing the sins of the people, which he bears as the representative. He stands before the angel confessing their guilt, yet pointing to their repentance and humiliation and relying upon the mercy of sin-pardoning Redeemer. In faith, he claims the promises of God. You can see some of the present experience he claims saying we have the experience of forgiveness, humiliation, mercy, and faith. Then the angel, who is Christ himself, she says, the savior of sinners, puts to silence the accuser of his people, declaring the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebu rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? As the intercession of Joshua is accepted, the command is given, take away the filthy garments from him. And to Joshua, the angel says, behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. His own sins and those of his people were pardoned. Israel was clothed with change of raiment, the righteousness of Christ imputed to them. I'll come back to my first question. When do the saints receive the garment of Christ's righteousness? Here is a passage, a statement, which indicates that they receive something as a result of their forgiveness, confession. Okay? Just note this. I will summarize this a little bit later. Jumping on a little bit uh, to page 585, she says, um, yeah, before I go there, uh, it was by faith in the coming Savior that Joshua and his people had received pardon. Through faith in Christ, they had been restored to God's favor by virtue of his merits. It's the faith confession business that gives them the garment of Christ's righteousness, isn't it? 
Now it gets more interesting. This is just the beginning. As Satan accused Joshua and his people, she begins to make application now. So in all ages, she accuses those who seek the mercy and favor of God. He is the accuser of our brethren, which accused them before our God day and night. Quoting Revelation 12. Over every soul that is rescued from the power of evil and whose name is registered in the Lamb, Lamb's book of life, the controversy is repeated. The case of Joshua, high priest, is the, is the case that is happening in the life of all of us. Satan's accusations against those who seek the Lord are not prompted by displeasure at their sins. He ex exalts in their defective characters, for he knows that only through their transgression of God's law can he obtain power over them. His accusations arise solely from his enmity to Christ. Through the plan of salvation, Jesus is breaking Satan's hold upon the human family and rescuing souls from the, his power. All the hatred and malignity of the arch rebel is starred as he beholds the evidences of Christ's supremacy. That is in the lives of people, change lives of people, change people. And with friendish power, Fendish power and cunning, he works to uh, wrest from him the children of men who have accepted salvation. He leads men into skepticism, causing them to lose confidence in God and to separate from his love. He tempts them to break the law and then claims them as his captives, contesting Christ's right to take them from him. Here comes an interesting passage. Satan knows that those who ask God for pardon and grace will obtain it. Therefore, he presents their sins before them to discourage them. Against those who are trying to obey God, he is constantly seeking occasion for complaint. Even their best and most acceptable service, he seeks to make appear corrupt. By countless devices, the most subtle and the most cruel, he endeavors to secure their condemnation. In his own strength, man cannot meet the charges of the enemy. It's in no one's power, from human family. In sin-stained garments, that's what we have. Confessing his guilt, he stands before God. That's all we can do, confess our guilt in filthy garments. But Jesus, our advocate, presents an effectual plea in behalf of all who by repentance and faith have committed the keeping of their souls to him. He pleads their cause and by the mighty argument of Calvary, one quishes their accuser, his perfect obedience to God's law has given him all power in heaven and on earth, and he claims from his father mercy and reconciliation for guilty men. To the accuser of his people, he declares, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. These are the purchase of my blood, brand plucked from the burning, and to those who rely on him in faith, he gives the assurance. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. All. Um, still there? All who have put on the robe of Christ's righteousness will stand before him as chosen and faithful and true. Satan has no power to pluck them out of the hand of the Savior. Not one soul who, is, who in penitence and faith 
has claimed his protection, will Christ permit to pass under enemy's power? Again, the robe of Christ's righteousness is mentioned as the result of penitence and faith. Zechariah's vision. Now she begins to be even more specific. Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing scenes of the great day of atonement. This is why I'm spending time to going through this because now it's coming uh, all home. The remnant church will then be brought into great trial and distress. She's going into the day of the atonement, the day of the Lord. Those who keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus will feel the, uh, the ire of the dragon and his hosts. Satan numbers the world as his subject. He has gained control over of many professing Christians. But here is a little company who are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them uh, from the earth, his triumph would be complete. So he is going for the destruction for God's people just as he wanted to destroy Israel when they came out from, uh, from Babylon. Those who are true to God will be menaced, denounced, proscribed. They will be betrayed by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends, even unto death. Their only hope is in the mercy of God. Their only defense will be prayer. They only rely on mercy and the prayer. As Joshua pleaded before the angel, so the remnant church with broke, um, brokenness of heart and unfaltering faith, faith will plead for pardon and deliverance through Jesus their advocate. The question of forgiveness, faith, confession and pleading comes back as the core here. They are fully conscious. Listen to this. This is we're talking about the people uh, on the day of judgment, the day of atonement. They are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their lives. They see their weaknesses and unworthiness and they are ready to despair. The tempter stands by to accuse them. As he stood by to resist Joshua, he points to their filthy garments their defective characters. He presents their weakness and folly, their sins of ingratitude, their unlikeness to Christ, which has dishonored their Redeemer. He endeavors to affright them with the thought that their case is hopeless, that the stain of the defilement will never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy their faith at the end, that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their alliance, loyalty uh, to God. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins. That he has tempted God's people to commit. He knows exactly those sins. And he urges his accusations against them, declaring that by their sins they have forfeit divine protection and claiming that he has the right to destroy them. He pronounces them just as deserving as himself of ex uh, exclusion from the favor of God. Are these, he says, the people who are to take my place in heaven and the place of the angels who united with me are these the ones? Because I know their sins. They profess to obey the law of God. But have they kept its precepts? He asks. Have they not been lovers of self more than lovers of God? This is the remnant on the day of the atonement we're speaking about. Have they not placed their own interests about his service? Have they not loved the things of the world? Look at the sins that they have marked their lives. 
behold their selfishness, their malice, their hatred of one another. Will God banish me and my angels from his presence? And yet afterward, those who have been guilty of the same sins, thou canst not do this, O Lord, in justice. Justice demands that sentence be pronounced against them. They deserve the same thing as I do deserve, right? Sorry. But while the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves up to be controlled by the satanic agencies. And again, we come back to the same issue. They have repented of their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition. And the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. He who has been most abused by their ingratitude. He pleads for them. Who knows their sin and also their penitence. They know they are sinful. Satan knows that. Christ knows that. But Christ also knows their penitence. He declares, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. I gave my life for these souls. They are graved upon the palms of my hands. This is the third time Christ says, Lord rebuke thee, Satan. They may have imperfections of character, Christ declares. They may have failed in their endeavors, but they have repented and have forgiven and accept and, uh, and I have forgiven and accepted them. Let me just make a um, footnote here by saying, notice the strong already and not yet. There is lots of already. The repentance, the forgiveness, the acceptance comes through here as the already salvation. That is the basis for the judgment they are facing. The assaults of Satan are strong. His delusions are subtle. But the Lord's eyes upon his people, their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them. But Jesus will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. Their, their earthliness will be removed. That through them the image of Christ may be perfectly revealed. How is that possible when they are sinful and imperfect? Coming slowly to the end. At times the Lord may seem to have forgotten the perils of his church and the injury done her by her enemies. But God has not forgotten. Nothing in this world is so dear to the heart of God as his church. It is not his will that worldly policy shall corrupt the record. He does not leave his people to be overcome by Satan's temptations. That is the temptations of saying you are not deserving Christ's forgiveness. Right? He will punish those who misrepresent him. But he will be gracious to all who sincerely repent. To those who call upon him for strength. For the development of Christian character. He will give all needed help. In the time of the end, the people of God will sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. With tears they will warn the wicked of their danger in trampling upon the divine law. And with unutterable sorrow they will humble themselves before the Lord in penitence. Again, confession, penitence. The wicked will mock their sorrow and ridicule their solemn appeals. But the anguish and humiliation of God's people is unmistakable evidence that they are regaining the strength and nobility of character lost in consequence of sin. It is because they are drawing nearer to Christ because their eyes are fixed on his perfect purity, not on their perfection, but Christ's perfect purity, that they discern so clearly the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Meekness and, lo and low 
loneliness are the conditions of success and victory. A crown of glory awaits those who bow at the foot of the cross. God's faithful praying ones, as it were, shut in with him. They themselves know not how securely they are shielded. Urged on by Satan, the rulers of the world are seeking to destroy them. But could the eyes of God's children be opened? And were the eyes of Elijah's, uh, as were the eyes of Elijah's servant at uh, Dothan, they would see angels of God uh, encamped upon them, holding in check the host of darkness. As the people of God afflict their souls before him, pleading for purity of heart, the command is given, take away the filthy garments. Again. But this is in a not yet context now. And the encouraging words are spoken. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. I think this is the third time she mentions this issue again, but this time in the not yet context. The spotless robe of Christ's righteousness is placed upon the tried, tempted, faithful children of God. The despised remnant are clothed in glorious apparel, never more to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. Why? Because there is no more corruption in the world. Their names are retained in the Lamb's book of life, enrolled among the faithful of all ages. They have resisted the wiles of the deceiver. They have not been turned from their loyalty by the dragon's roar. Now they are eternally secure from the temp tempter's devices. Their sins are transferred to the originator of sin. A fair meter is set up on their head. Notice the context. This is the context of the day of atonement, the not yet context here when they are going to be no more tempted and their sins taken away to the originator. While Satan, I'm slowly finishing here, while Satan has been urging his accusations, holy angels unseen has been passing to and fro, placing upon the faithful ones the seal of the living God. These are they that stand upon Mount Zion with the Lamb. This is in the not yet. It's when they stand, these things are happening with the Lamb. Having the Father's name written in their foreheads, they sing a new song before the throne. It is a scene where people are before the throne. That song which no man can learn, save the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth, these are they which follow the Lamb, whichever way he goeth. They are absolutely loyal to the Lord. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was, not, uh, was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And the last paragraph. Now, is reached the complete fulfillment of the words of the angel. Hear Joshua, hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellow that sit before thee, for they are men wandered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Christ is revealed as the redeemer and deliverer of his people. Now indeed are the remnant men wandered at, as the tears and humiliation of the pilgrimage give place to joy and honor in the presence of God and the Lamb. In that day, and now she ends quoting Isaiah, that was the context uh, um, for the last uh, passages. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent, 
and comely for them that, that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. That's how she ends chapter 47. The whole chapter provides, and I spent some time going through this, the most systematic exposition on this subject. And uh, I encourage you to take this and read this perspective with uh, the book Great, of, uh, Great Controversy, chapter, end of chapter 38, chapter 39, and it goes to chapter 40, actually. But the whole chapter provides a fascinating and a very eye-opening account of present and future elements as they relate to salvation and perfection of God's people in the end time and then specifically time of the coming of Jesus. Uh, what is so fascinating in the passage is that it suggests that into the final showdown the saints will go who with best intention to progress in Christian perfection, sanctification their lives have still not reached absolute perfection let alone complete sinlessness. They are pretty much aware of this issue. Satan is aware of this. Christ is aware of that. It is fascinating because all know this. The saints, Satan, the Christ. They know about the real estate of the people of God. That it is not finished yet. It is still imperfect. Yet, most importantly, why they are justified and accepted by God despite their incompleteness and Satan is not is because they have the experience of repentance, forgiveness, acceptance, change of heart, change of mind. In other words, they have the experience of the already, of salvation, the whole package of that. They, because of that, their characters gradually reflect Christ's character in their attitude to sin and to God. In other words, they are loyal to God. They are in Christ. But oh notice, they are not yet free from all imperfections and defects and the full perfection and sinlessness experience is only waiting for them when there is a second exchange of garments. And, this, and the third time Ellen White mentions that, she speaks about the spotless garment which will never be defiled again. That day is the not yet perspective of salvation. She clearly introduces a shift from imperfection to perfection, from insecurity to security, from pilgrimage to joy in the chapter. And it is on that day when they will stand on the mouth of, uh, it is on that day, the day when they will stand on the mount of Zion with the Lamb, with Father's name on their forehead, with the character of God, in other words, in their hearts and minds. That's the key issue. Satan does not have the character of Christ on his mind. He doesn't like Christ. They love God and Christ. And that is the difference between the two groups. Uh, it is the day when they learn to sing a new song before the throne. It is then when they are eternally secure. Their sins are transferred back to the originator of the whole controversy. Now they receive also the spotless garment of Christ's righteousness. They received the garment of Christ's righteousness when they confess their sin in their present experience. But on that day, when they're experiencing all this, they receive the spotless garment of Christ's full righteousness. And they will never again defile it by any temptation or sin because that has been removed from them back to Satan. This is the day when the pilgrimage replaces joy and it is the not yet day of the Lord. 
please notice how in the whole chapter, the author presents both perspectives. The already experience of salvation, including gradual character perf perfection, which is focused on change of heart and mind, developing loving attitudes towards God and others, including, of course, practical actions. Developing loyalty, which becomes the key in the final judgment. They are in Christ and therefore pass. But also, she develops a not yet perspective, which is clearly explained as containing full removal of sin from them to Satan and receiving the spotless robe of Christ's righteousness, which will never be defiled again. Their earthliness will be removed and the image of Christ perfectly revealed in them on that day. They sing a new song as a result of their new salvation experience. They stand before the throne of God and the throne of Lamb. It is this perspective I, pro I propose to you which we need to keep in mind when also engaging with those uh, chapters and the pages uh, from the Book of Great Controversy that you see behind me. In conclusion, and I'm happy to discuss actually the Book of Great Controversy at some other point and the chapter there and, the, uh, and, and getting under skin of and White there because she has a very interesting perspective there as well which we quite, quite often miss. But in conclusion, concerning Ellen White's use of perfection, allow me to say that for her, this was an important biblical teaching. The Lord has impressed this matter on her heart and she has faithfully represented it to us. Unfortunately, the subject has caused us few headaches because it is not always easy to get under her skin. You need to read in a much broad and larger context. And maybe also because our own perceptions and reading habits may have been informed by some other perfectionist roots from our past that I have mentioned earlier. I am, however, convinced, and I wanted to demonstrate this to you, share this uh, with you today, that Ellen White shares the fundamental already and not yet perspective of the Bible writers as well on perfection and salvation. Uh, we will do well as God's people if we try to develop our understanding of salvation and perfection on this platform. And I am hopeful that it will lead to better understanding of Ellen White, but also to better appreciation of this doctrine of Christian perfection, which sometimes it is, it is simply swiped away under the carpet because we have very Greek or Calvinistic definitions of that as absoluteness. While she speaks about the perfection of our heart attitude, which of course has actions in it, but it's possible to be loyal in this sense to God in a perfect manner, but not in a sinless manner, she says. Thank you for your attention.